Hello, welcome to another exciting lesson in the volumetric effects module. Previously, we mentioned that the volumetric effects are a bit like painting with light. We had a space filled with some kind of mist and the light uh, reacted with this space, tinting it and creating gradients in it. Now we are going to uh, go one step further and literally paint our image with volumetric layers. We will use a workflow that gives us a lot of freedom and rely on the power of post-production. In this scenario, we will tackle some new concepts for the first time. Firstly, we will accept that our rendering does not necessarily have to be the closest to the final image. We will only set some specific and deliberate pieces of the image in 3D, which only when combined in Photoshop will give us a look and feel we are looking for. Great creative freedom will suddenly open up to us if we free ourselves from fine-tuning everything in 3ds Max. The second new concept in this lesson is that our architecture is not our primary hero anymore. In fact, this is the first scenario where uh, the building is actually not the subject of the image. The frame remains the same, but this time it is a completely different story. We'll focus on people that are about to use the hot springs in the center of our composition and we'll tell a story around that space. Let's take a look at the image we will be aiming for. The foreground will play an essential role here, standing out clearly against the dense volumetrics. And the interesting thing here is that the sense of depth is built through silhouette sequences. The most important thing for us will be what is happening here, above this hot spring. We want to achieve a vapor effect that goes from very dense, near the surface of the water, to a relatively homogeneous haze somewhere above. And we want this transition to be much more than a trivial gradient. What we are looking for here is a certain quality and nuance characteristic of billowing smoke. Ok, we can move on to our scene and immediately notice that two of our characters are already in place. Here we have two models, one from Human Alloy and the second from 3D People, which for obvious reasons we can't include in the scene, but you are free to put any characters you want here. We are mainly playing around with the silhouettes of these characters in the scene, so there is no need for some highly detailed models. However, what will be important is their position in the composition. We are going to read these figures as a relatively central element of the picture and it is worth ensuring that their position in the composition is not completely random. I position the pair in the form of such a triangle and I feel that this accentuates the contrast with the vapor well. We want to build this composition based on this contrast. It may not be a typical commercial scenario, but we don't want to create the impression of some kind of abandoned space. In addition to the two characters, the scene will also include interior lights. Their presence uh, should be enough to bring the architecture to life in the background. Ok, we can proceed to build the lighting in the scene and uh, the very beginning will be very similar to what we learned in the night scene. This time we will choose PG skies 2124, which gives some nuance to the sky. It is not included in this training, but either of PG skies or 3D collective night ones will work. And right away, I want to mention that there is a box behind the camera. We are not going to insert it again, it's exactly the same thing as in our first lessons. So we are going to plug in the Corona color correct here and we are going to put the whole thing into the rendering setup scene environment. Make sure we've got the interactive layers turned on and we are off. Perhaps I should switch those ones off. And I forgot one thing. When we are checking the layers, let's turn off those moss layers as well because we are going to do this scene in the water variant. Now we can start interactive.
and as it stands, we can't see much apart from the indoor lighting. We need to raise the exposure of our HDRI. Let's raise it a little bit more here so that those interior lights also resonate a little bit more. That's okay for now. Now it's just a matter of rotating it. We want to outline the cool dynamics of the clouds. We need to raise it a bit and it should be okay. We will use ACES for the tone mapping here. Generally it's quite dark, but that shouldn't worry us at the moment because we'll be introducing a lot of volumetrics here, which will diffuse that light for us and boost those shadows. So, for the time being we don't really have to change anything in tone mapping. We have some clouds formation and their presence seems to be justified since the whole image plays around such themes of fog and vapor. We will position them so that in addition this very line plays with the composition. Now, if you remember the nighttime scenario, we avoided the global volumetric material in favor of a local box because we didn't want the fog to interact with all the lights. Whereas now, this interaction of light and fog is exactly what we want. This is the exact opposite situation and we will basically play with the whole picture based on this interaction. You will see what we mean in just a moment. But for this reason, a global volumetric as a base is perfectly okay. Okay, I have this rendering setup hidden here and now we can create a corona volume material. We can assign it to the global volumetrics. And let's start with something here. Perhaps we can also raise this directionality. It's going to improve the impression of this kind of non-uniform fog a little bit. And as for now we have a very sparse fog and we are unlikely to see it in the foreground and background, but we will come to this more pronounced effect in a moment. And for the time being, we are just setting up the base, so that the whole thing takes more naturalistic feel. Similar to what we had in the nighttime typology for our base atmospheric lighting. And exactly as before, we'll have a slight additional relight to our base. The difference is that at night we had to think about many elements of the overall composition. Here, however, we want to improve the composition in a simple way. We will try to isolate the silhouette of our building and this tree in the foreground. Another difference is that last time it was challenging to find the right angles to illuminate the edges of the objects. Now it's definitely going to be easier because instead of illuminating objects in the scene, we are going to illuminate empty space. You know, it's this sort of shift in our thinking. We are not lighting the objects, but we are lighting the space instead. Maybe I will reduce that a little bit so that we have more space. Let's put a corona sphere here. Somewhere here, I think. And let's raise it somewhere here, looking at this view, so it's behind the building. And now we can adjust the intensity of this light and the color. We have these blue tints visible everywhere here, so we'll go somewhere in this direction with the color. Okay. 
and let's have a look at what happened here. And I kind of like it. One simple light and the sheer volumetric effects make this space pop. From a compositional point of view, it's a great tool. We don't have to worry about illuminating a lot of details somewhere here among the trees and losing the hierarchy in the composition at the same time. Instead, we just get a clean gradient of space and beautifully rendered silhouettes. Now, what if we would like to make this fog denser at this area? Well, we are not going to increase it globally because we will disrupt the whole perception of the scene that we have previously set. However, we can locally enclose this forest with a box and give it a smaller absorption distance. So let's try to do that. Let's put this box in here and we can rotate it so that it's more or less parallel to the building. Put this sphere in here and give this material some sort of smaller value. By the way, let's get some tint here. And we can see that the rendering potential of this silhouette improves even more. We are working on a lot of volumetrics here, so I'm going to switch it over to material color. I'm going to move it a little bit in this direction, near the corner. so the silhouette appears even more pronounced. The whole area has also become darker, because less atmospheric light is able to penetrate through this fog. We can also notice that the edges of the box here are somehow visible. You know, maybe we are not dealing with a very concrete border, but we are immediately able to notice that the fog on the right and left is completely different, and this is not a natural transition. On the other hand, at this point, we'll just accept that because uh, we'll put the final image together in Photoshop and what we want is just to get the materials out of Max to help us with that. We can therefore assume that the subject of the rendering potential of this building silhouette is resolved at this stage. Maybe the blue is a bit too much. Okay, I think it's going to be better now. Okay, so the silhouette seems okay to me. And we can hide this element for now, so that we don't have to make these renderings unnecessarily. We can focus now on the space in front of the building itself, the tree and possibly those lines imposed by the boulders. We will therefore insert the corona disk here somewhere on the left hand side. and we point it somewhere like this towards the tree. We are going to modify its values, maybe make it a little bit bigger, and modify its color. We don't want cold light this time. I think we'd like to go in with a warm light, so we are going to set the color temperature to 3500 and we are going to add a little bit of directionality here to have it more focused. 
Now we want to position it so that it illuminates the tree for us. And it's hidden somewhere behind this slope, so we don't have a problem with reflections being visible. We will place it somewhere here, towards this embankment. At the same time, we are going to turn on the target. And we are going to steer it towards our tree. If there is too much light, we can move it a bit. If we have some trouble seeing these directions, we can always raise that directionality to one. We can see now that we are not hitting the tree perfectly. Maybe I will turn it a little bit here. And we will lift it higher. Okay, now we hit that fold perfectly, so we can go back to that directionality that was useful to us. So, as we can see, the rendering potential of this edge here, between foreground and midground, is definitely improved. Similarly, we'll insert a disk on the right and try to cast some light on those boulders on the right. So let's create a new Corona light. That's obviously too big, so I'll make it smaller for now. I will turn on the target and more or less set it up for now as I see it. It's easier to check it from the top. So obviously it's too low for now. We need to raise it a little bit. We can increase that directionality again so that it's more visible. And we can already see that the light is showing up for us here. Maybe it's a bit too strong, so I'll decrease it, and we also don't necessarily want it to shine on the characters themselves, so we will rotate it a little bit. It should be better now. Maybe something is still falling on the characters there, but it's not that much. What still buffers me though is that the light is overflowing somewhere around here. We need to tinker with that and see how we can get rid of it. Just a notch. Okay, we managed to calm it down a bit. We are not bleeding light here anymore. I like how this edge looks right now. In general, we didn't intend to illuminate this space too much again. We want to add some nuance and increase the readability of forms. And now, we are approaching something new. What remains is basically the last but probably most important light of this relight. We will create the luminosity of these vapors above this hot spring. And we want this light to literally radiate upwards. 
And for this reason, we will create a large corona disk with a diameter slightly smaller than the spawn itself and direct it upwards. It doesn't need to be exactly in the middle, it can be moved forward a bit, but keep in mind not to interfere it with the stairs. Because, you know, we don't want to illuminate them strangely from underneath, which can create some unnecessary shadows. We are going to bring it up quite a bit and set the directionality to zero, as we want this light to scatter around. And we'll go back to some more or less blue light color. Maybe we'll make this disk a little bit smaller and move it as slow as we can. As we can see, it started to intersect with the terrain now, so something like this should be enough for us. Well, we'll probably need to increase the intensity a little bit. And it's a rough placement for now. This area doesn't have that vapor, but we will get into that in just a moment. I would just like to take one more step before we put this volumetrics in. We can say that the water is definitely not lit evenly. We can see a glow from this light here, but it is lost as we get closer to the edge. And I think it would be better, it would read better if the water was illuminated all over. Now, it might be difficult to do it solely by this light, so we will use an additional trick here. We can do it by controlling the material and not necessarily controlling the light. We are going to open up this material of our water And through a little cheat, we will brighten this water through self-illumination. We go into the material in the advanced tab. And we see this water already has a color set here, but the multiplier is set to zero. So we will change it to one. At this point, all the water should illuminate the light to some degree and we are able to read the whole surface of water in a much more homogeneous way. Probably this effect seems too strong and also a bit unrealistic, but believe me, it will look much better after adding the fog. Even though it looks a little bit weird for now, it will make more sense when we use this element later on in Photoshop. Keep in mind that we are aiming to create a final image out of a few renderings. In addition, we will prepare two other renderings with different forms and densities of this vapor. And we will use all this to build up the final image in Photoshop, so it will become clear when we approach the stage. Ok, now we are going to start building variations of fog somewhere between the foreground and background. So let's create a sphere somewhere around this area. It would be convenient if this light falling on the tree was outside this sphere, so we'll make it a little bit smaller. And we'll assign a volumetric material to this sphere, certainly denser than what we've had previously. We can copy the material we had in the forest and let's say halve this value. And we can see right away that the detail is lost and even more, the impression of the area changes. The silhouettes of the figures and these stones are much more pronounced. Maybe I will go down from this blue to grey because we might get some color cast otherwise.
there is still some glow somewhere on the sphere, so I will try to reduce it a bit more. And it's coming from this light. It has already calmed down a bit, but perhaps we can go into the settings of this light. And we can simply exclude this sphere. Then we won't have to worry about this light directly interfering with it somehow. And now we can make it even bigger and there should be no problems. We don't have that strong scattering from that side and that's perfect. So this image we have right now will be one of our variants of the fog, which we will render later. And again, it might sound weird, but you will see how that works in just a moment. We can copy this sphere and hide it, and we are going to make our second variant. It's going to be much more expressive. We want to focus on the area of the densest vapor above the hot water itself. We are just copying this sphere and scaling it down in these two axes. We'll get kind of a big egg that we are going to place somewhere above the water. We can scale it even more. Okay, now, generally, this fog should be very dense, so not much light is going to get into it. We can reduce that thickness yet a little bit just by scaling it in two axes only, making it even more egg-like. And we are basically going as slow as we can with the fog, so let's try 10 times denser. And as we can see now, it's almost a black pancake. So maybe we can try to scale down the whole fog in all axes this time. And we check what the gradient looks like here. It takes a little bit of time to denoise it, but we see that it's much better now. Above all, we look at how this light spreads from this hot source. And here we see that the water looks much more natural. The character's silhouettes look pretty nice as well. Perhaps we could maybe try directionality at 0.6. And that didn't change much, so we'll basically stay with what it was. We could try a little bit sparser fog. Generally at this point I don't want to have anything visible behind it. We don't want to have a building information, just this strong gradient of light that's limited by this fog. And it's already so much brighter. I might go back to that 150 though. It seems too dark, but that's also an interactive issue and I think in the final rendering it will look just about right. Maybe we can raise it more here. Uh, 
and now the effect should be much better. And that's more or less what we are looking for. It may seem strange in the context of the whole image, but at the moment, as I said, we are trying to look only at the context of this contact line here, these two figures of ours. You know, we can ignore the area of the transition between this quasi-egg and the rest of the scene. It's something we'll deal with in post-production. And in general, our work in 3ds Max can be summarized by the fact that we have prepared several variations for rendering. The first will be our base, which is this natural base with relighting. It doesn't have those weird volumetric objects. We basically just have this global volumetric there. In our second approach, there's going to be this fog box that we've encased around the forest. And the other two are this sphere and this egg that we had just set up around this hot spring a moment ago. And you may think that having to do four renderings instead of one is a rather poor deal. But by doing so, we save a lot of time setting up the scene so that it looks good in 3D. And being able to decide the final look in Photoshop gives a huge amount of extra freedom. And in fact, if we are being chased by time, we could probably trim the process down to just two renderings, namely the base and this egg. But there is nothing chasing us here, so we'll use the extra renderings to bring out more nuances and make smoother transitions in Photoshop. Which means we basically have everything we wanted. I'm going to switch this layer to high res and basically render all the variations. So, okay, post-production then. We open Photoshop and upload all four renderings as layers. At the very bottom we have our base with global volumetrics. Then, sequentially, the forest, the sphere and our egg. And yes, we are going to work exactly in this order, starting with the thinnest volumetric and ending with the densest. So, let's start with the forest. We want to keep this slightly denser fog on the left, so that the silhouette of the building comes forward a little bit more. And to do this, we will apply a mask. We can fill this mask with black color. And we take a simple soft brush, a normal soft brush, preferably with a slightly lower opacity. we can use the white color to draw on the layer. Just by the edge of the building. We don't want it to go anywhere beyond the trees, so we mainly focus on this place. As far as these elements are concerned, we don't want to do anything else. Above all, it's all about the forest in the background and we don't really have anything more to do here. So we are concerned with making that unfortunate edge disappear somewhere in the air here. We have limited the layer to just this area, so we can move on now to something more serious and tackle this area. And here we apply the mask again. We operate with a large soft brush again. We try to leave this layer fairly intact on the left so that it kind of reduces this contrast on the building and flattens the image a little bit, just in the vicinity of this tree outlined on the left. Perhaps we can leave a little bit of it over the hot spring as well. However, we are removing it here from those areas. And I can even do this with a gradient. And now, with a soft brush again, I'm concentrating on making this layer appear primarily somewhere here. And it was trivial enough. We limited these layers to these two areas. And now, it's time to move on to that key element, which is dealing with this egg of ours. 
We can copy this layer and hide the duplicate. It will come in handy in a moment. For now, we'll take care of that. We'll apply a black mask to this layer as well. And with a soft white brush, we are going to draw a little bit of this mask, a little bit of this layer over the water again. We want it to dissipate upwards, but keep in mind that the silhouette of our building here has to be readable. Something like this. Now we can deal with this copied layer. Add a black mask and build the substance of this dense vapor. So far we have soft gradients everywhere, but now we want to see this kind of a nuance of turbulence. And we are going to need a brush that simulates smoke in some way. And this is probably one of the most popular types of Photoshop brushes, which can be downloaded or purchased on hundreds of sites, ArtStation markets included. Just look for fog or cloud or smoke brush. Now, all we have to do here in the brush settings is to make sure that this brush doesn't work as a stencil. So it doesn't leave the same image over and over again. This brush should have some basic dynamics. Usually, an absolute minimum here is to change the angle jitter in shape dynamic, which will make this brush rotate as we use it. Now, if we wanted to paint here, we can notice that we are painting something which looks quite naturalistic. Yeah, it's not just a copy of one image repeated over and over again. With this brush, we are able to draw a little bit of the detail of the vapor smoke. And, by the way, I'm doing that on a separate layer. I would like to keep it if it comes out well. I would like to not interfere with it anymore. So we can draw some of that here and there. We can weaken it in some places as well, so it's not 100%. But we can add this brush detail. And as we can see, something more interesting is already starting to happen here. We have lowered this area to about 60, so we just outline more detail in this place. That's how we continue to work with this brush and focus primarily on the transition between this bluish vapor above the water and this yellowish mist on the left. This luminous fog looks like it's also reflected here, somewhere in the water below. And here we can also use a soft brush to soften it up a little more as you can see. Alternatively, we can also add an adjustment layer with a curve, just affecting this copied layer, and if necessary, give it a little boost on the curve to make it more expressive. And that should be enough as far as it is concerned. Now we can tackle this area of the egg. It ends somewhere here. And here we have a little bit of detail that maybe we don't want too much. These stones, stairs, we don't necessarily want to have that there. 
but we can do it not by uncovering the layer, but just by pouring some color here. So we are sampling this color. And remember to have a 3 by 3 average here, so that we don't accidentally sample some of the extremes in the noise. With this color, we simply take our brush again with a low opacity value. And we are working with it here to blend these areas a bit more. And at the same time, we get this texture of if there is something more going on here in this volumetric layer. It's much more nuanced. I think it complements the image nicely for us. I'm careful with those edges. I mean, I could use a mask, but I will simply try to be more careful. And, of course, we can see that with such volumetrics here, we have a lot of noise that comes with the rendering. So, it's always a good idea to add noise here to this newly painted content, even at 1 or 2%. Then, immediately, this area that we have drawn in will become more similar to the rest of the image. Alright. So, we've already got these layers sort of merged. There are a couple of other elements that are a little bit off for me. Why don't we create a new layer and use the clone tool, where we can sample all the layers here, just to blend this flickering of light in the water. I feel that they are unnecessary, they just distract us. I'm going to darken this layer so that I don't lose the detail. It will be better right away. I don't want this light to shimmer either. Similarly, I will deal with what I've dealt with before, for example in the overcast scenario. Well, and here also. I think a piece of water, unfortunately, came out backlit somewhere, so we can also clone it. Now, we can just add a vignette and deal with the overall colors. And I'm going to add a bold vignette from the bottom here. And change the blending mode to soft light. I will add a second one to cover that corner still a little bit, because that detail is completely unnecessary there. I think we can deal with colors now. We are trying to adjust the colors through selective color, and I'm mainly concerned with limiting all those blue and purple tones, and turning the whole thing fairly teal. At the moment, the colors are already relatively complementary, so all we need to do is play with the specific channels. Let's see how reds change. Let's maybe remove some cyan and check magenta. So we turn those yellows a little bit and subtract some magenta. We are narrowing it down. I would add some yellow. No, we might add some magenta. I would give more of that and cyan can be subtracted.
I would still increase the black to darken it a little bit. So somewhere not so much. Okay, so we have turned it into this kind of clear orange. Now, as far as our blues are concerned, in cyan here, I would go bold with this cyan. The magenta doesn't change, and we can add yellow so that it just turns it into this kind of teal. And you can darken it all. As for the blues, well, we have just such a little bit of color, more twisted towards that magenta blue, so we would definitely remove the magenta and add yellow. And then the blues would be a bit to one side. When it comes to neutral colors, I think you can add a bit of cyan so that it flats most of the image. Maybe a little bit of magenta and maybe some yellow in general. The color of the image could be ramped up a bit. Maybe we will pour a little more color somewhere in here, into our dark areas. Okay, I think we are almost finished. We could go back to a few more things. The first thing I would come back to is this layer. I noticed that the light came out here somewhere, So we would mask it a bit so it wouldn't annoy us. And what's more, here I have the impression that this glow and this sky come through a little too abruptly. Maybe I would have given it a bit more of a soft brush here, only here where this egg ends. So, that's a bit unfortunate. Maybe I will do it differently. I'm going to sample this color somewhere in here and pour it here on a new layer. I think that this kind of stroke with this color will bring it all together a bit. And it's much more believable now. It's still this guy standing here that could be a bit darker somewhere in this detail. Maybe we could just darken him in the shadows with this burn tool. It's a bit clumsy to use, but generally I don't need too much action here. Perhaps a bit more. Okay, we will just do it again with this cloner. And I think it doesn't get in the way. Yes, I think the whole thing should be acceptable now. And we are done. Well, that was something. And just to summarize, this scenario and approach is quite advanced, but it comes really handy. So just to make a quick recap, we have the initial situation after inserting the HDRI, making the depth with the global volumetrics, and inserting the relights behind the building to draw out the silhouette. Next, we approach another relight in the foreground 
to draw out those silhouettes here. We add an overlight from the water, just locally here, without too much impact on the surroundings. And finally, we can take all those pieces and put them together in Photoshop, as we just did. And that's about it. Okay, we are slowly arriving at the end of our series. There are three more lessons left. We have prepared something really cool next, so we hope we see each other sooner than later. Thanks again and see you in the next one.